Hola, comadres. Welcome to another episode of Comadreando. I'm your host, Marcy. And today we have a very special guest, Hazel. I'm going to let her introduce herself. Who are you? Hi, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Marcy. Uh, my name is Hazel Veras. I'm a mom, early childhood educator, uh, so many other things, entrepreneur. Um, I like to make things at home. <laughs> And I think that's about it. Okay. Um, so Hazel and I were, she was like basically my mentor teacher. She was like one of my first friends when I started teaching at this one school. And um, she was like the one that was like the most friendly to me. And then eventually we became like really, really good friends. And we're like besties. And um, so today's topic is nutrition and activities to foster creativity in children ages zero to three. And it's one I've been discussing a lot. I've seen discussed a lot in different articles and different forums. And I want to, um, I would hear people suggest to people with children with autism to stay away from gluten, to stay away from processed foods. Um, and I want to kind of, uh, I wanted to kind of get into that with Hazel and, um, discuss it because uh, right now she's actually vegan. Well, not vegan, but she's more heavily plant-based and she's done a lot of research. So, um, we want to kind of talk about it and give um, suggestions to parents. Um, remember guys take this, these suggestions with a grain of salt, because at the end of the day, everybody's organism is different and everybody's body processes things in a different way. So I said that you are heavily plant-based, right? But I wanted to ask, what is your nutrition profile? So, um, heavily plant-based, I do dabble in some proteins. It depends if my body is asking me for it. Because I know after being in quarantine, during quarantine, my body was going through, I don't know what it was going through, but I was, um, I had a lot of allergy, allergies towards different types mm. of food, including some veggies. So I had to be careful with that. And my body wasn't processing correctly. And I would break out in hives in my eyes and in my face and my neck. Oh my so, God. Yeah, so I had to wean off of a lot of food. I lost a lot of weight. Then I started gaining weight again, and my body was craving meats. And I was trying to, you know, give my body what it wants, but also being in tune with what your body needs um, is really important because you could be vegan for good reasons, but if your body is craving something, you need to give it to it all in moderation, of course. Mm -hmm. So that's my profile right now. Mm -hmm. now. So what made you decide to change um, to more heavily plant-based and incorporate some different kinds of proteins into your diet like besides the hives and everything like right i remember at one point we both watched that um documentary on netflix oh what that the changed hell? our lives that, like completely <laughs> we were like mm, maybe yeah. we shouldn't be eating all that exactly junk. changed our lives um i i don't know i just started tasting different things in the food in yeah. a way that i did it before and i'm very sensitive now to chemicals and things that are put in our foods and I taste them off the bat which is so weird like I can't I love potato chips can't eat them anymore because they taste like cigarettes to me and it's like why does Doritos taste like cigarettes I can't eat them um fish that's frozen tastes like soap I don't know what it is but I'm very very sensitive to certain types of foods and the things that they put in the foods to preserve them mm. so um and, and that is something that our children that have autism are very, very sensitive to. And some of our kids, they like the junk food because they don't taste those things in it. And, and they stick to one particular food. And I swear, I think that's the reason because they are very sensitive and keen to certain ingredients and things put in the foods to preserve them. You know what's funny? Um, you're saying the the cigarette taste, and I'm remembering when I was a kid, I wouldn't be able to eat peanut butter and jelly mm. because to me, when you would combine the peanut butter with the jelly and the bread, it tasted like cigarettes to me. Oh, every yeah. freaking time! And then, um, I had gastric bypass surgery. Remember, um, back mm -hmm. in 2000? Oh my god, uh, 2011. I want to say right, and you know, you go through this process. Basically, you're like a baby again. You, like, stop eating everything that you usually eat. You go to, like, clear liquids, and after the clear liquids, you move up to, like, basically compota, like, you know, right. very um, mushy Soft food. food, yeah. Soft foods. And then you, you start incorporating certain things into your diet again. Once I did that, 
that my palate basically got cleansed and I got rid of all the toxins in my body that I started tasting everything again. It was so like, there are certain things I still can't eat. It's very off putting because I can mm -hmm. taste the chemicals. Like, especially like I used to be a big McDonald's person and I don't knock anybody that eats McDonald's, Same. but I can literally taste the chemicals in it. Like, you know, like even when you're trying to quote unquote be healthy, mm -hmm. I remember one time I ordered one of those mango, um, smoothie things that they sell girl i don't know what mm. chemical it is but it, i cannot tolerate i can't palate yeah. it and that makes me feel good that you're saying that because for a while my mom my husband everyone was like what's going on with you why are you tasting chemicals in food and i'm just like i don't know but it is what it is now i do taste things and if i taste a chemical i won't eat it mm -hmm. because i taste it and i'm sensitive to it so what was your diet like growing up? I know we're both Dominican, but like what kind of things that your mom used to like make and eat that you yeah. really can't eat anymore? Uh, beans. No, nope. I cannot. I cannot. Even, even if you like, even if you like um, soak them yourself. No. Nope. Oh, wow. No beans. I can't digest them. Um, but regular Dominican diet, rice. I can't eat rice. The rice gives me stomach cramps. Mm. Um, and if I do eat it, it has to be minimal, less than a cup. Because if not, I can't digest it. And um, just, you know, basic rice, meat, platanos, all that good stuff. Yeah. Did you have any food allergies when you were a kid or this just developed None. now? None. Just developed now. Um, it happened during quarantine. I don't know what I was going through, what changes my body was going through. But it was definitely saying, you need to wake up, sis. Because <laughs> you're not <laughs> eating this. <laughs> and if you do eat it, your eyes are going to swell and you're going to look crazy. Oh, my God. <laughs> Yeah, so no, I feel like all of us during quarantine, like we all went through like, uh, like a mass awakening, basically. Absolutely. Like everybody, everybody's more in tune with their bodies and like mm -hmm. more aligned with the things that, um, you know, the things that are not really good for them. So yeah. it's 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 very um clear. Some of us have not still, you know got into that point but the majority of us that have it's it's crazy because it's like you know you've changed we've changed like completely from for sure for sure you know from who we used to be to now so to now, it's, yeah it's very interesting and that it's very refreshing I, at one point i felt very like alone and then and now i'm like discovering like so many other people are like feeling the same way and like mm -hmm. like kind of considering themselves more um Instead of like thinking more right. of like whatever it is that is supposed to be correct. Yeah, we feel alone because we think that no one else is going through this, right? Mm -hmm. And which is the same thing that happened to me. And I, I went in, I went inward and secluded myself and I needed that. It was so healing to do that, to be able to do that. And so in a way, quarantine was a blessing and a curse, but it was definitely more of a blessing to me because I just I learned about myself who I truly am right and and that happens with our kids too right mm -hmm. our autistic kids they're always inward they're never outward we and were we live we're living outward directed lives they mm -hmm. are living inward directed lives and they're like you know I'm gonna do what I want to do <laughs> yeah and yeah. this is the thing this is like um I was on a podcast uh for a wind and cloud podcast shout out to Rick and um, Al Alexandra and um they basically asked me they're like so what have you learned from your child and I'm just like to not give a crap about I tell what, you that all the time yeah about what other people have to say about other people's opinions like Aiden is very inward driven like he's very self-driven he's gonna do what makes him happy yeah you know and he just came out like that and for us the like neurotypicals we're looking at him well not me anymore but before I used to look at him like kind of like dude you need to you need to follow conform. the rules. Conform. You need to conform. This <laughs> yeah. is not this is not quote unquote normal. And right. that is not that is not what he came here to do. He came no. to disturb and like offset everything and kind of right. teach us how to be more ourselves. Because a lot of the time we're we're um we're living out these lives that is miserable. I remember during quarantine and I and I spoke to you about this, I felt kind of like very like i don't even know how to put it into words just very like uh como se dice not deceived kind of 
just like kind of cheated, like, like cheated, cheated, like yeah. like waking up every day to do the same thing and and jump into the hamster wheel. And I was just kind of like, there has to be more to life. Like this cannot be it. It it's cannot like be. We it. were uh, brutally awakened to that reality that we were doing that. And in a way, you do it, and sometimes you're like, oh, I need a break, I need a vacation. And then you go back and do it again, and yeah. you're okay with it. But this time, it wasn't okay. Mm-mm. This time, it, it, like, hit you in the face, and you're like, oh, my God, I can't keep doing this. Yeah. Like, this is not it. You cannot wake we- up every day and be unhappy and, like, show up to a job and, like, do the thing and then go back home and sleep and do right. it over again the next day. Like, a Right. No. And it's also, it also awakened us to be more honest. And live our truth, despite the fear that you may have for speaking that truth. Yeah. That's something that I learned, like, whoa. Mm-hmm. I, I, it, it just got to a point where my body was even telling me, like, you need to speak up. Mm-hmm. Like, this is it. So, going into that part, like, that's a good segue. Um, What is your career? Right? Yeah. And then we can talk about all that stuff. So, like, what is your career? What made you go into early childhood initially? Mm -hmm. And then what happened after you basically, you know, kind of awaken and align yourself with who you really are? Right. So my career is, by nature, I've always wanted to work with children. In the beginning, when I was in college, I thought I was going to be a pediatrician. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't hack the hours of study. I was like, no, I need a social life. (laughs) (laughs) So that uh, gave me segue into psychology, which landed me into nothing with psychology. I was in business and human resources and advertising. And then um, come 9-11, it was a little awakening for me. So now I know, now that I know what I know, I understand that I was awakening in, in like, segments in of phases. my life yeah. yeah in phases so 9-11 was a huge awakening and I just I was like I need to do what I want to do because life is short and I want to work with children so I quit my job in advertising I was making great money and I started working in a daycare for no money <laughs> like I was a slave it was bad and um while I was there, I looked for another job and then I went to Head Start. And then from Head Start, I took my test and went to the DOE. Mm-hmm. And that that's where I really blossomed. And I started teaching gifted and talented children, dual language. And then I went into the other um, K1 and 2 grades and I started teaching there. I absolutely loved it. Yes. I was in my thing. Like I'm getting goosebumps just talking about it. Um <laughs> And then, you know, I was there for years and I was teaching, teaching, learning, learning, teaching, teaching, learning. And then um, I something hit me and I was like, I need to leave the classroom. I was done. I was noticing little things that I was just not OK with the way administration went about things. And I understand it's a system. They're doing things from above, you know, people from above are telling them to do things. It's fine. It's a, it's a top down approach. It's a top using. down. Everything is top down. It's really not centered around the kids because. In reality, it should be a upside down pyramid, right? Where the children are on top and everything else is on the bottom, but it's not like that. So I started noticing those things and I started researching what can I do, but still stay in the realm of teaching. And then I got into coaching, which was an outside of the classroom, helping the teachers, which I was like, that's great. I can do that. Mm -hmm. And even then the bureaucracy wants (sighs) to leave the classroom is To the point where it's nauseating. And then the things I started learning once I started doing my administration, because I wanted to be an admin. Mm -hmm. And and I was told by a superintendent that I didn't know how to play the game. That's when I was like, this is unreal. Yeah. I I was like, what game? Like, I I didn't realize we were playing a game. I was like, whoa. And to hear that from a superintendent of schools, I was like, "Mm, something's wrong. And then came COVID and I had, uh, because I was a coach, we were put into virtual teaching and I was assigned some kids and I had such a hard time understanding what they wanted me to accomplish with these kids online. And I wasn't Mm -hmm. even in person with them. And I I was just so like disgusted and just turned off. And I really didn't do what they asked me to do. I did what I knew was best for the kids. I only taught two subjects the whole day. It was Mm -hmm. reading and math and I did it in small groups. And then I did two big group meetings and that was it. Mm-hmm. Whether or not they liked it, I didn't care. So I was already pushing 
the line, right? And I mm-hmm. was already speaking my truth and and just standing my ground. And then last year in June, I decided that I needed to resign because it was no longer fitting for me. And, and it wasn't my, serving you either. My body was in, it was bad. Like I would get um, panic attacks. I would get nervous breakdowns. I would cry because of the kids. I, I, I just couldn't do it anymore. So uh, August of last year, I quit. I resigned. And people were like, oh, you're crazy. Your pension and all these years. I don't so, care. So what? I, so what? Paper is money. I mean, money is paper that we give value to. I don't care. And I firmly believe that once you pick, and once you listen to you and your inward directive, nothing is going to go wrong for you. Mm-hmm. It may be hard because it's a different style of living. I'm n- I'm not used to it, mm-hmm. and it's it's confusing at times and very complicated. But mm-hmm. um, I did it, and it was a grieving period, Mars. Like, yeah, I oh my god, oof! I cried. I was here in my house, like I'm such a failure. I'm a loser. I'm not doing anything. I mean, I've been working since I was 15. Yeah. So to wake up every day and not know what your day is going to look like, I didn't know how to handle that. Mm-hmm. But when you really honestly pull back and think about it, that is what life is. We cannot plan life. Mm-hmm. Life is not predictable. It shouldn't be. So, you know, I embraced it after like six months. I started saying, okay, I'm going to pick myself up. I started working on me. I was meditating, watching my diet and all of a sudden, all the answers came to me and it was just like, oh my God, parents are pulling their kids out of school left and right. I am a teacher with 19 years under my belt. And I understand now that kids need to be free to flow within their own multidimensional bodies. If we are multidimensional beings. We yes. don't understand that. We're just learning that. Mm-hmm. And the kids come in knowing that. That's why... They want to dim their light so hard with all this programming. And, you know, that's what school does. Basically. And, and, and guys, I'm going to like touch on something. Like I send this to Hazel all the time. The, the systems of education that are in place right now were created to have workers, to have workers that they're going to okay. look down, do their job, you know, eat, survive, go home and come back. That's it. So the problem with that is that we are no longer in that, in that timeline, right? We are, we are in a different timeline. People now are working in jobs that those people in the 1800s would never have thought of a person working virtually. Like, what is a computer? What are you talking about? Right. We can work from home. What? Um, so that no longer serves us. The system of education needs to change. We need to foster creativity in our children. We cannot continue to stamp out the 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 how they come in free, right? I like the 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 model of like the Montessori schools, like the kids are learning yeah. and playing, play, learning through play, yeah. right? This is how children are supposed to learn. Like this whole like sit down, no, you got to do this, you got to answer this. No, that is all. That is all like teach like programming the children to be subservient. To just follow and not question, right? Absolutely. And then the thing is now the system of education is trying to adapt all these new, the old system is trying to adapt the new ways of quote unquote, pushing the kids to like push their thinking. It doesn't work in that system. Like if you're teaching the kids from, from like an early age to sit down and just listen, but then you're trying to teach them to to go beyond that and, and, and um, push their thinking it's not going to work in the system that is existing right now. So it, yeah, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. And then that's, that's why um, we saw that influx of behavior issues in the the classrooms. Right. When I was 2005, I was writing my thesis for graduate school and I did it. My thesis was literally named what is happening to our children's garden. We are living what I wrote in 2005. Mm Mm-hmm. I said it. And that's the year when they came into my classroom and totally told me that playtime is over and I needed to take the kitchen area out, the dramatic play area out, and it will be replaced by subject matter being taught to these kindergarteners in a dual language setting. And I was just like, what is happening? 
I was devastated, but I followed suit because what did I know? I was a novice, right? I yeah. didn't know. And at that just, point, they would have been like, your kids are going to learn better if you put a pink t- post it on your forehead. And we exactly. were going to do it because it, they are the bosses, right? Like they're, they're the, the bosses, ones that are telling right. us what to do. They're the ones that quote unquote know about education better than we do. Mm. And we're just learning. And so, you know, back then I knew and, um, If anyone wants to pick up a copy of the book where my thesis was published, it's called um, Education Matters um, by Beverly Falk. And she is um, an early education um, director in City College in New York City. And she wrote that book and and she selected several theses from the course that she taught. And one one of uh, the theses was mine. But um, it just talks about what education looked like in 2005. And even then we knew we already knew what was coming down the pike. But the years that followed saw an influx of behavior issues that were like chaotic. And of course, because now I understand that these children, whether they be rainbow children, indigo children, star children, whatever it is, they all come with that new frequency. The um, I don't give a you know what frequency. That's what they come with. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do me. They are inward directed, directed by the in by the in me, (laughs) not the Audi. Yeah. And so that's what happened. That clash came and the the behavior issues were crazy. And so new things needed to be implemented, like, you know, accident reports and all these things and whatever. Um, But it's just insane. And this is why it's happening. And now even more so these kids and after being home in quarantine, they're not having it. They they, They go to school and they mad. They're mad. They're mad all day. (laughs) And I'm not even in the classroom anymore because I'm teaching here from home. And it's wonderful because I'm, I'm actually servicing the parents that understand. They understand. And they, they took the chance to take their kids out of that programming and give them a a different, a different experience. One that's going to let them shine, shine their light. And, and give them an opportunity, a space, an environment that is nurturing and look, <laughs> that is nurturing and um, that allows them to to live their their unique um, lives, like their unique purposes that they're here for. Sorry, let's go back to what you were saying. So, yeah, they're, they're coming in with. The keys, right? And then we're taking these keys away because we're limiting their thinking. It's but, crazy. And then we're just... So, go ahead. When go. You, when, sorry, but when you remove yourself and, and you see it as, as you know, you're an observer, you understand the reasons why it's being done, right? It doesn't benefit the government, the systems that are in place for these children to go out and be unique mm-hmm. and be themselves and live their purpose that they come with. We all come with a purpose. Mm -hmm. I know this now. And I always felt it. I just didn't understand what it was that I was feeling, but now I'm able to put it into words. We all come with a unique purpose. And this is how it works. Just like every plant has a unique purpose, we Mm -hmm. all have a unique purpose. And, And when we put them in schools, we dim that light and we take that away from them. And they become angry. And this is why in middle school we see children that are so angry because it's just like, they don't know who they are, what they're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. They don't want to sit down and learn about whatever history or fractions or whatever. They want to do something that's important to them, but they just don't know what that is. Yeah. They never had the chance to figure that out or to explore what they really, really love. Exactly. You know? Yeah. Um, I remember as a kid, I was really, uh, my happiest moments where I was like really Zen. Cause I've been reflecting a lot on that was mm-hmm. like when I was creating. So, um, I, I used yeah. to like literally make all kinds of stuff. Like, uh, at one point I thought I was going to be a fashion designer. So I would take like scraps <laughs> of material and make Barbie doll dresses for my doll. Um, besides that. Dad used to encourage me to continue to draw. So I would like make all these designs and stuff like that, which was cool. Uh, what else was I into? I used to like to like paint and draw and sing and dance and stuff yeah. like that. And then at one point, um, oh, um, not my dad, oh, oh, somebody was like, you think you're going to make money like that? Like, right. You know, How are you going to make money like that? What are you going to do? Gonna make like, money. Yeah. You can't, you can't major in that. You're not going to, 
you're not going to succeed or you're not going right. to uh, be able to be viable and do all these other things. Mm-hmm. So it was kind of mm-hmm. like, you know, stamped out in a way. And then, and then after I stopped drawing and stuff, like I started writing and then reading Right. Because I would like escape into these books. And yeah. then at one point it was like, you know, life stepped in. I was in college and I had to read all these crazy textbooks. And it was like reading that I was not passionate about. I mean, I still did it, but it was like then after I graduated, I didn't have time to do the things that made me happy. Right. So it came to a point that like the depression like started setting in really heavy. And this is the thing, like. Yes, people have chemical imbalances in their brain and things like that. But I feel like depression and anxiety is a direct result of us not following our calling and not tapping into the things that we're here for and what we're supposed to be aligned with. I 100% agree with you. Absolutely. And this is why we see depression um, at such early ages now, because they know. The kids know. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't don't know what your audience believes in, but... We need to embrace that. Mm-hmm. They know. They come in. So we have two strands of DNA. These kids are being born with three. Three. Three strands of DNA. They know about the food. They know about the school system. They know that when they feel something, they need to do it because this is the frequency and the energy that they're coming with. Mm-hmm. They're very, very aware of what's going on. Which is why the, the school, the kids don't want to be there anymore. There's, I mean, I have parents that have called me and like, and they're like, yo, my, my daughter's in school, but she's having a nervous breakdown every day. And I don't understand what's going on with her. One of my friends, she was on the show and she, um, she was like sharing that with me. And I was, mm-hmm. I wanted to talk to her more about it, but I feel like it's a conversation we need to have in person, but like definitely right. Like she would have anxiety attacks or like she yeah. would call in or go to the nurse because her stomach hurts. And I don't yeah. think that she's just making it up. I think it's her body's natural reaction. Like, I, I mean, don't want to be an there anymore. And when I was teaching online, my, my stomach was hurting. Mm-hmm. But now I understand that I, my body communicates with me through my solar plex mm-hmm. area. And, and that's what was happening. It mm-hmm. was just like pushing it out. Like I needed to listen to that. And then I would like break down and have anxiety attacks. And that's what followed. And ever since I stopped, I've never felt like that again. When <laughs> this particular school that we were teaching at before um, Varys left and um, I switched schools um, was a particularly toxic environment. It was like, I know for a fact that we were placed there because we needed to see. So, I think um, so. Yeah, we needed to see in different aspects, right? Because I saw it from from that administrative point, and then you saw it from the classroom teacher point, and it's just insane. It used to make me sick, guys. I really went through like a whole like depression, anxiety, like episode thing, and I was not well. I was not well. I literally, um, I didn't know what to do. I was like having panic attacks. I was having breakdowns. I was like you know, physically ill. I was not going to work. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, my body was not, my body was like, sis, what are you doing to yourself? Right. Like really? Right. Um, so, you know, it came to a point that I was like, I need to go. <laughs> I cannot stay here another year. No, and I'm glad you did. Um, and I'm, I don't want to apologize for, for us working there together. No. because I think it served its purpose. Yeah, it did. Absolutely. Uh, but, um, I'm so glad. I think you're so much better off for it. And so am I. And, and the fact that we did it together along yeah. with our other friend, um, really helped us because we had that safety net, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it, it, it was just kind of like, we both went through the, like, I feel like my timeline for like opening my eyes was like a little bit more forward than yours at one point but then i feel like you caught up so fast and it's 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 really crazy because it's like yeah that should hit me in the face i was like it was like like karate chop in your face you're like bitch and it had Um, to be that way for me because if not i was like oh everything's great everybody's so nice and And it's funny because it's like i've always been like that friend that you're like oh my god this person's (laughs) so great and i'm like are they really? Yeah, you always question it. I'm like, I don't understand. Why? I'm like, are you not seeing? <laughs> yeah, I did not see. No, no and I then now, I feel like now, like, we're both, like, we're like, 
we do that little yeah. that little that little mm-hmm. meme face like mm, mm-hmm. i don't know um but yeah like so let's talk more about nutrition right so yeah my question that i wrote down for you was how does nutrition in children from an early age affect health in the long run and we're talking about health like spiritual as well as physical oh my god it's so important so if you feed your kid junk then his physical and spiritual will be junk it's cl- it's it's almost like um it's calcified, right? It's like a film that's placed on top of your spiritual calling and your, and your, and your body functioning correctly. And that's what happens. It's it, not only does it calcify their, their spiritual, but also their, their, the pineal the, gland, the pineal gland. And, and that is so important. We don't know that where I think, well, I, I'm going to speak for myself. I'm learning that now. And, and I'm so in tune now that when, when I hit something on the head and, and I connect with it and it resides with me, I feel it here. Mm-hmm. And it's so weird. It's so weird <laughs> because it starts like tingling and I'm like, okay, I don't know what that means. But <laughs> now I know. And these kids know that. And and the fact that some of these kids come in and they just want to eat pizza or just eat like McDonald's, just the French fries or just the nuggets or whatever. They're very selective of the junk that they're going to eat. But I think that's all uh, by design. I think mm-hmm. it's all by design. They 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 don't want to eat anything else but that. And not only your kid, but I'm surrounded in my family. I have my my cousin's baby Dylan. He doesn't eat anything. He likes maybe like a piece of cake and maybe the nuggets from McDonald's, if that. Mm-hmm. But um, what parents need to know is that these kids are very selective and they will never starve. They're never gonna starve. Mm-hmm. They will never let themselves go to the point where they're going to starve and and hinder themselves. Um, But it's important to know. But I want to also, because the thing is like, yeah, the kids like, okay. So Aiden went through stages, like Aiden at one point was just like milk, right? All he wanted to drink was milk. Even after he had the, like, you know, I would give him compota and stuff like that. But then once Mm -hmm. the onset and the onset of autism happened, he would only want milk. Then it got to a point he would eat yogurt he can't tolerate yogurt anymore he does not drink milk anymore either he hates both of them so and then he got to the point that he was eating food right Mm -hmm. there was different foods that i would try with him and like sometimes he would like actually throw up and um some of them like still like i'll show him like a piece of lettuce or the lettuce will be near him and he's kind of like doesn't even want to see it yeah. Um, so we're still working on that, but like, just because they, they come in with like a certain, um, preference of foods doesn't mean that you shouldn't try. I think you should try, but it shouldn't, it shouldn't be to the point that you're forcing your kid to eat something. Cause that creates traumas around food and you don't want right. to do that to your child, mm-hmm. but definitely like offer it. And if they see you eating it, you know, make sure that you're eating in front of them and they see you eating different foods. Cause that could motivate them to eat different things. Like now Aiden yeah. eats like pancakes and waffles and, and scrambled eggs in the morning, which is right. something that he, the other day he had dumplings like from an Asian. Oh, wow. Store. Like I made sure it was like organic, obviously, right. but you know, he's trying different foods, but on his own time. So that's another thing I want to touch on. Right. Um, the native American definition for autism, I can't pronounce it. I'm going to put it in the show notes, but mm-hmm. it's Taki Watang, I want to say. Mm-hmm. And what it basically means is in their own time, they yeah. know when they are ready to do things like yeah because everything is in layers it's mm-hmm. like an onion right and and i understand that now so we're all going through the same thing but in different ways mm-hmm. even the kids that with autism um because even in my awakening it was in layers and mm-hmm. it's still in layers i'm still peeling back the layers and it's mm-hmm. always another level another layer another level of opening of my consciousness and understanding mm-hmm. and so that's what it is in their own time. And unfortunately, the medical system doesn't help parents because that's what we do when we don't know to, to heal. them. No, it's not, it's here, not to here to heal. And, and unfortunately, what we need to wake up to is that doctors are taught to diagnose and give you the medicine. That is it. But the medicine is not supposed to cure anything. <laughs> it's not no. supposed to cure. No, it gets you on a hamster wheel. Yeah. Of you know, have you seen the commercials on TV? And I just laugh at the at the side effects. And I'm like, why would I ever take that? 
You then might it may die. cause blindness. You may die. Your heart might stop beating. And I'm like, <laughs> why am I going to take that? Like, you know, it's crazy. So it, the medical field is not here to heal, holistically heal yeah. you with your your mind, your body, and your soul. Like, it's not, it, does, it doesn't work in those, Mm-mm. in that trio, right? Um, unfortunately, it doesn't. And when parents of autistic children run off to the medical field, they really don't get the assistance that I think, and I am not a mother of an autistic kid, mm-hmm. but I, I do have a lot of friends and family, like I said. Um, they don't really support that healing. Mm-hmm. And that letting them go at their own pace and, you know, letting them unfold the layers as they go. And if they just want to drink milk for two years, let them drink milk for two years. The next two years will be different. Yeah. I, I, um, so through, through, through the podcast and like me researching and following all these different accounts, I follow uh, a couple of adult accounts with autism. Um, one of the people, his name is a different spectrum. I think you shared one of his videos with me. And, um, another one is, um, something autistic. I have to, I have to look at it, but Mm -hmm. basically I learned this new thing called masking, right? Mm -hmm. Masking is the way that autistic people find of coping of being around neurotypical people. Right. So that they can blend in. They're masking who they really are. Mm -hmm. And that kind of like just exploded in my brain. That was your nephew. Um, (laughs) So um, it basically like exploded in my brain because I'm like, wow, like, you know, we think that they're um, we think that they're. Quote unquote getting better but what they're learning is to mask who they really are and all of that so you know it just it's just really uh that that point just takes me back to the example that i said Mm -hmm. we're all going through the same thing but in different ways we were masking ourselves also Mm -hmm. to fit in yeah until you know we start waking up and then there's there's people that are born that don't mask at all They're just like, I'm me and I'm unapologetically me all the time. (laughs) And that's wonderful. And Mm -hmm. that's what we need to learn how to do in this world. But it's really, really difficult. Yeah. Cause like, especially, and then, and then I, what bothers me is that one of the, one of the episodes that's going to air for this season, um, Mm -hmm. she's amazing. Her mom, her name is, um, Imani Jones and um uh, her her IG is a hippie mom. So basically she was like very much like us, like very awake and you know, she was trying to schedule out the uh, the injections for her son, right? Mm-hmm, um mm-hmm. the vaccines. And um I think she fell behind on her schedule and she was missing some and she went into the doctor's office and basically they got really angry. And forced her to vac- vaccinate her kid to the point that they were like, oh, we're going to call CPS on you. And she's a 20 right. something year old person. She doesn't know any better. And she agreed to it. And her son actually yeah. had a vaccine injury. Right. Oh, wow. He had a vaccine injury and it resulted in him having autism. Her son was speaking and he does not speak anymore. I mean, they will never admit it, but I think many, many of the millions of cases because of the spike in autism, right? Because it went in one year, it was like one out of every, I don't know. And then the the next year it was like one out of every eight. And I'm just like, what's happening? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, Um, it was caused by that. Vaccines are really um, detrimental to our bodies. Yeah. And and we say, oh, it's to keep you safe. And so that you don't get like polio or anything like that. But um, they do have side effects. So the whole thing is for me is not like I'm an anti-vaxxer because I've said this on the show before. Like I'm not like don't vaccinate your kids, blah blah blah. Okay, just like we're some of us are allergic. Like you're allergic to a lot of things, right? Right. I'm right. not allergic to those things. All of our bodies are different, and these vaccines are like one size fits all. They're not tailor made to your organism, so there are going to be people that react to them differently. And it just so Absolutely. happened that these children yeah. are hypersensitive mm-hmm. and. You know, the cocktail, this is my problem, right? It's not like don't vaccinate your kids. It's like the cocktail of things all at once in one, one day. Yeah. 
I think yeah, I mean, there's one there's one visit the kids get like five or three. Yeah, that's, and that's a lot. That is and a there's lot. so much shit in that stuff that we don't even know. And how how like you know what I'm saying? Like it's just it's just wild to me yeah. and the fact that people are pushing this narrative that, you know, it is for the greater good. I'm not saying don't vaccinate your kids, but we should have the freedom of saying, Okay, yeah, I'm gonna vaccinate them, but yeah. I'm gonna do it. This day I'm gonna do this one. This way I'm gonna but, do the other one or whatever, yeah. without threatening a parent's um, autonomy. You know what I'm saying? Right. But this this is also opening the eyes to, of parents and and learning how to speak your truth, like we said earlier, about your kids. Don't be afraid to protect them. Mm-hmm. If your intuition and your gut is telling you, I don't have a good feeling about this, listen to that. Because it is so, so valuable that we tap into that now. Because that's all that matters right now. Your intuition is here to guide you. And we both have it, men and women. It's just been so dumbed down and so numbed and so quieted for so many years that we don't know what that feeling is. We're like, uh, I don't know, you know, I'm getting a bad feeling, but I'm just going to go with this person. Yeah. Right. And, and, you know, just to speak about the Amish, they don't vaccinate. I mean, granted, they're secluded from modern society, but they don't vaccinate and their kids are healthy. Mm-hmm. And they, they grow up to be healthy parents and healthy adults and they mm-hmm. give birth to healthy babies. Um, and I'm not saying not to vaccinate your kids. That is a total personal like thing decision. That you, right. But um, be informed. Look yeah. into what it is that's going to happen or what might potentially happen. And and also go with your gut instinct. Like do your research. Absolutely. absolutely. Like I have a friend that she was pregnant and she's she's like oh she's like very much she's like researching everything and then she's she found a study that said that um the cereal that you put in the milk for the babies oh. can cause like adverse effects in your children. Absolutely. So, she did not give the kids cereal. She didn't even give them any of the processed compotas. Like she was making her own stuff. Yeah, you should. I mean, we all have to go back to that at mm-hmm. some point. Um, I did that during quarantine. I just, I started to make things and I was just like, whoa, I'm making this and I'm making that. And now I'm in the process of learning how to make bread because I don't want to buy bread anymore. You know, I, like, I don't. <laughs> so, so the one thing that we noticed, like when she, we were working together, she would, she has a gluten allergy guys. So when she eats gluten, her stomach gets rock hard. She does not like, she'll get, yeah. um, uh, uh, outburst of what is it the the eczema acts up oh, too right it's horrible yep and then um we noticed that she got croissants that were fresh made from this bakery by the school and she would not have the same reaction so mm-hmm. we're thinking like what is in this processed bread that is causing her to have these reactions so like you know you have to kind of listen to your body like if your body is giving you a bad reaction to something that you're yep. eating, definitely do not eat that. Like, you know, there's a way if it's, especially if it's processed, you can make it yourself. Yeah. It does take more time. It does, and it does, you know, this yeah. corre, corre lifestyle, like this run, run, don't stop lifestyle that we live. Like, you know, you have to take time for yourself and like, listen to your body. I feel like Always. that's one of the things that I want the audience to take away. Yeah. And then, um, that also affects our kids, all that processing in the foods, um, especially our autistic kids. They are very sensitive to everything. Um, if you put something in their body that they don't agree with and it could, it could give them behavior problems, headaches, um, they could get angry. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, it runs the gamut of the. There was, there was, there was a point that Aiden was having. I know it was a transition into junior high school. You mm-hmm. remember that, right? Like I remember, at the yeah. yeah. So he was having issues with um, aggression at school. Yeah. We couldn't figure out what it was. Um, they would call me. I would have to go pick him up. He wouldn't be able to calm down. Then I started thinking about the stuff that he was consuming, mm-hmm. um, what we, we were putting in his body. I was able to take that out. And then Aiden's back to his normal, happy-go-lucky self. Absolutely. You yeah. know, it, it, like, you know, there are certain things that, we give to our kids. We need to look, really, really look at what it is we're giving them and and what we're exposing to them to because, like, they might be not necessarily allergic, but they they might have adverse effects, and we don't even know what it is. Like, it could no. be something as simple as a soap you're using to take a shower. 
Oh, if for you're sure. Diluting a yeah. certain deodorant, you know, things yep. like that. Especially kids that are on the spectrum, they're so hypersensitive to things. To and it, it, it's, things. it's, it's really, um, bananas. Like the, the first episode that's airing, um, she's a woman, uh, uh like a, an adult with autism and, and she didn't get diagnosed until she was later on in life. But, um, she tells me that when she, is overstimulated or something is not mm-hmm. does not go well with her system like it's to the point of nausea like she's nauseated oh wow and she can't tolerate whatever it is so it's it's really like it's just being more in tune and more in line with who you are and like really listening yeah. to your body guys cuz this yeah. is part of the part of um being more conscious is like li- really listening to yourself yeah. and not and ignoring. listening to your kids because you know how we grow up and you're like oh you're just a kid you don't know what you're saying mm-hmm. they really do know what they're saying yeah and who who are we to tell them about their little bodies you know what i'm saying like mm-hmm. if they want to eat something or they don't feel good about something that needs to be heard and and we need to validate that because it's like you said once we start saying you're a kid you don't know what you're saying mm-hmm. that goes in and they sink it down and it becomes trauma. And then it starts just accumulating inside of them. And then they become this adult that doesn't know how to communicate mm-hmm. as outbursts. And it's just, you know, it's time for us to break all those generational things that we carry. And now is the time. There's no time like the present, especially now where our consciousness is opening up. And, and we're actually learning about what it means to be a human, right? Mm-hmm. We don't know yet. The The medical industry says that they know about our DNA. No, they don't know. They don't. They the Well, if you think about it, the people on the top, whoever they are that are running this whole show here on the planet, <laughs> um, <laughs> they know more than anybody who we are, where we come from and everything that we don't know because we forgot. It's time for us to know about it. And this is why our bodies are waking us up to that. It's time. So, um, going back a little bit, um, let's talk about activities that parents, cause the thing is the school that you're yep. running right now, mm-hmm. what activities do you suggest for parents to foster that spark in their children mm-hmm. to foster that spark that the children are already born with and to tap into that creativity and also to like encourage speech in their children too. Cause like, yeah. you know, because you have that specialty of early childhood and also, you are more um, conscious. Like know that there's activities that parents can do to help their kids more, you know, and, and like yeah. really get to know who their children are mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. let them, their children, um, what is it? Take them, not to take them. Well, yeah, take command of who take they command, are yeah. and like the things Absolutely. that they're learning. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, first and foremost, it's that um, emotional support, letting your kid know that if they feel sad, they want to cry um, or they're angry, giving them space and holding space for them to feel those emotions. Because if we don't do that, um, what happens is, again, they swallow it, it becomes trauma, and then it starts escalating and escalating and escalating until you get an outburst, which is what we're used to seeing in the classroom, right? Because these are kids that are not heard. They, they Nobody's holding mm-hmm. space for them to go cry somewhere. Mm-hmm. No one is holding space for them to go be angry. And so we, that's the basis that we need to start with so that then they understand that it's okay because it's just an emotion and emotions are temporary, not forever. Mm -hmm. And we grew up knowing that emotions are forever. Yeah. Like, oh, that makes me angry. And then it becomes a trigger. And this is where triggers come from. Right. Mm -hmm. So if we make the, make that basis for the kids. And they have an environment where they understand that if they're sad about something, they're going to go cry about it. And when they feel better, they come talk to you Mm -hmm. and it's over. They release all of that negativity out of their body and away from them. And it's forgotten because they also have to understand that we live in the moment. Mm -hmm. There is no past. There is no, no present. There's no future. There is only now. Mm -hmm. And so when we teach our children that, they understand it and they're like, for the now I'm sad and then I'm going to let it go and I'm going to feel how I'm going to feel and then it's over and I'm back to being Hazel again and I'm happy and I'm playing. So that, That's one of the things that I really like, I talk to my students about, like you're having a moment. That's it. When you're ready, we can talk about it. That's it. You know what I'm saying? Like, mm-hmm. I'm not pushing, I'm not pushing this narrative like, oh, you got to talk, you got to be happy. No, no, no. 
you're having your moment. It's okay. Yeah. Breathe it out. You're going to be okay. And then when you're and ready, we it. can talk about it. You but know? it has to be intertwined into the environment. Mm -hmm. So there comes a point where everything is flowing and the kid knows, okay, I'm sad. I'm going to go over there and cry and then come back and talk to whoever I want to talk to and let them know what I was feeling. And that's how they cleanse themselves out of that emotion. Because in essence, we are here to understand our emotions because we are emotional beings mm -hmm. and deal with them and then move on. Because what was practiced in the past is that you have an emotion and you take it and you sink it in and it's part of you. Like and it's then it not okay to be angry. It's not okay. It's not okay for you to cry. It's not okay for boys to cry and show emotion. It's not okay for a girl to spaz out because she doesn't like something, mm -hmm. you know? So, and that's, that's what makes it so rigid and so controlled. And then that's what creates the outburst later on. Mm -hmm. So and I think that's a good basis. I mean, I think it's a great basis to start. So emotional support. Um, Absolutely. Gemma. Emotional support, um, granting them uh, an environment where they can make mistakes. Making, I mean, God, the DOE says it all the time. Yeah, you can make mistakes, but really, can you? Because mm -hmm. you can make a mistake, but then I'm going to test you on it and don't make a mistake again because then your test score is low and that reflects on you. Mm -hmm. We need to break away from that. I mean, I don't know when it's going to happen, but in, in my school, tests don't matter. I don't do a test. I mean, it's not like that. It's mm -hmm. more play-based, um, learning about myself. Uh, we practice a lot of breathing and a lot of, you know, things with our third eye and all those things. So that when they know that they have a space with support, that is like the ultimate win there. So for the parents that because, you know, there's going to be parents that are like very um, set into this. Academic. This, like, this academic system, right? So how do you, how would the students show you that they're learning? Like what kind of, there's no, there's and then those parents are not for me and I'm not for them. And that's okay. There's, there's something for everyone. Yeah. I work with early childhood. You cannot become a functional adult that is going to live a happy, purposeful life. If you don't know who you are from the get. Mm -hmm. And that is the basis that we are missing. That is the basis that was taken away from them and from us. In 2005, when everything changed, when I wrote that thesis, mm -hmm. that's why we need to go back to that. Play is so important. Imaginary play, play, any type of play, and also doing hands-on activities, um, grounding outside, working with plants, mm -hmm. working with wood, woodworking, creating things. If a kid says, oh, I have an idea and I want to create this, give them the time and the space to do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, you and I both know that for a while there we did a project-based learning, right? But how much of that was a project-based? <laughs> I mean, we would pick what they would do. Mm -hmm. that's, there's no freedom there. Mm -hmm. And that's not it. Like definitely project based learning, but kind of really giving your kid the the I'm talking about real the autonomy, mm -hmm. the autonomy to choose what it is that with autonomy. how they're gonna yeah, like how they're gonna you know something that comes from them. Mm -hmm. So um, a long time ago, there was um, a um, like an old generation where what they would do with their kids from ages two to age eight in their schooling, it was like a school system. They would just observe the kids and take observational notes and let the kid go into if they wanted to do music or they wanted to create something with wood and they would observe that. And then after a while, the kid wouldn't do all the areas, but select one path for himself or herself. Mm -hmm. And that's speaking to you without speaking to you, right? The kid is letting you know, I don't want to do music, art, or whatever. I want to work with wood, or I want to work with plants. And that's how they picked what they were going to do for the rest of their lives. If you look at the movie Soul, it literally... Oh my God, yes. <laughs> Soul is amazing. That is exactly like... That's it. But we kill that in the school system. They don't even know the kids, the poor kids. The, you, what's crazy is that, like, by if we continue to do 
things how they've been being done for so many years um we're gonna turn into those monsters you remember the monsters in the yeah. in the that they're just like me yep. that's it the machines right yeah. machines we're gonna turn into machines and um and that's what it's going to be. There's also a great show, and I don't know who streams it because I watch it on the Fire Stick, but it's called Severance. And it's about a man who severed his brain so his work personality doesn't un- know his out-of-work personality. Oh, wow. And in essence, if you think about it, that is exactly what we do without doing a medical procedure. We sever our brain because when you're at work, you don't think about your home personality. Yes. Yeah. The moment you get out of work, you're like, crap, I got to go cook. I got to do this. I got to do that. Right. So your your out of work personality takes over. Wait, didn't I used to tell you something that you used to crack up all the time? I'm like, summertime Marcy is very fun. Oh, and they're two go. different people. They, like, of course they are. Work Marcy during the school year is completely different than summertime right. Marcy. And I'm sure you're a different Marcy now because you guys are on break, right? Yeah. Yeah. So you're severed. We're all severed. And, and what's happening now and what happened to me is that I joined that and I'm not severed anymore. I don't need to sever myself. Yeah. I don't have a work personality and an out-of-work personality. And this is where we're all going. We're all going to get there. I mean, yeah. everybody at their own pace, but we're all going to get there. I'm going to send you some podcasts. There's like... um. It's called the Great Migration, which is some, mm-hmm. the phenomenon that's happening now that everybody's just up and quitting. Ah, uh, yeah. Open the, quitting, the Great Resignation, leaving. the Great Whatever. They great always have the label. That's what it is. Yeah. It's it's actually us awakening to, to our own truth and our own power. Yeah, which is awesome. Case in point. Yeah. Which is amazing. And I'm so happy that we're alive during this time. And I'm so happy that your child and the other autistic children have people like us to pave the way for them and speak up for them. Yeah. Um, because um, things are going to continue to happen until people really wake up. I mean, yeah. I don't know, just to change the subject a little bit, if you kn- know what's happening here in New Jersey, starting September, they want to teach some s- inappropriate things to children in grades, starting in grade one. And it's about their sexuality and how to please themselves. And, and, it's just craziness here in New Jersey. And parents are taking their kids out of school in droves. Wait, what, what, what are they doing? So apparently there's a new curriculum coming like, in it's September. It's like sex education, but you're doing it in the early childhood. Nah. Yeah. Like I'm all pro, like mm, explore your body, be free, do your thing. But I feel like there's a limit Right? So There's can you a limit. imagine no, you no. teaching in first grade? Absolutely can you imagine not. That? Absolutely not. Nope. Right. So this is what's happening here in New Jersey. And parents are taking their kids out of school in droves. And not only that, but the Board of Education here has already been founded to break that. They broke like two federal laws and two other laws with their curriculum that's coming out. And they still passed it. They still passed it. I got to do so, research on this. Yeah. Because this so, is making me upset right now. <laughs> oh, what? God. I've had headaches about it and everything. But there's, but. there's, oh, this, okay. So the, ugh, I'm very, I'm very sex positive, everything, you know, whatever. Explore your body. That is the, your body's your temple. You do whatever, you know, as long as it's healthy and you're not okay, harming but a another year person. Old, uh, but uh, 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 yes, a, a six uh, year old is not, and you cannot have strangers teaching your children about their bodies. I I just ask myself, I understand that fear is a thing, and that's how they control everyone in this world, right? Fear is what controls us all. Whether you want to yeah. acknowledge that or not, that is the truth, um, because I know, because I've been there, mm-hmm. <laughs> but I want to know and I'm very curious to find out how these teachers are going to stand up to this. Are they going to just do it and and feel how uncomfortable it's going to feel for them to deliver such a class like that to first graders? Or are they going to like stand up for it and say, I'm not doing that, regardless of whether you're tenured or not, right? Because 
that's what they say. Oh, if you're tenured, you can speak it's, your mind. But if you're not tenured, it's fear you based. Can't. Cause like, if you're not tenured, they're like threatening your livelihood and whether you're going to be able been. to produce money and all this stuff. And this is like, guys, and then this is something I'm, we're going to touch on it and, and then we can probably make another episode on it. But the way that they make teachers follow along is like threatening their livelihoods, threatening the their existence, threatening whether they're going to be able to be able to exercise their careers. Cause the thing is like the teaching career, that's something that's very, um, godly, right? Like yep. we, it's very selfless. It's something that you get into. And I'm talking about the people that have a real calling to teach. Cause there's people that teach, because they feel like it's cool or they feel whatever. They They're like not, the summers off. Yeah, they like the summers <laughs> off. The people that are really called to teach are there because they love their career. And the way that the the administration and, and the people, powers that be um, force them to do things is by threatening whether they're going to be able to do that thing that they love. Yeah. You know, but administration gets the threat too, right? And it's, so they, it's top down. It's definitely top down. <sighs> it's incredible. It's incredible, and it's 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 really bad. It's disgusting. It's just like such a big turn off. And for years, I really thought I was doing the right thing, and it served its purpose. And I'm so glad that I'm aware now. But um, something has to give, right? Yeah. So I'm just wondering how this is going to play out, and I, I I pray to God that these teachers get the courage to speak their mind. Yeah. Because if not, then my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. And with that, comadres, we're going to end this very lively, very enlightening episode. This was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want you guys to follow me at Comadre and the Pod on Instagram and you can follow Hazel at, if you want, you drop your, the school, um, the school. Oh, it's called uh, Nuna 5D Community. Um, just a little tidbit. It's not like a school school and I can't use the word school because then it means like, you know, mm -hmm. DOE or whatever. But um, I am a private membership education association. Okay. okay? All right. So oh, I'm going to put that in the show notes. And of course, if you guys have any questions for me or for Hazel, please feel free to drop a comadre gram at my email at comadreando at esctheNetwork.com or slide up into my DMs. And slide. I want <laughs> I want to thank you for spending um, the morning with your comadres. And thanks so much, Hazel, for being on the show. This was so awesome. Thank you. I love you. I love you more. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Don't hang up.